Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Boxing Podcast. We are sponsored by 32 Red. I'm your host, Dev Sarni, and with me is legendary boxing scribe, the pundit and the pun master. It is, of course, Steve Lillis. Good day to you, Dev. Good day to you. And uh, another sweet intro from you. I'm getting a bit embarrassed by him, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm going to be red face in next year here because they get better and stronger every week. So you can tone them down a bit if you want to, but I'm not encouraging nah, you to. Nah, I, I would never. And because you said red faced, you just literally reminded me of a joke that I made up myself the other day. I tried it on my wife. She wasn't too impressed. Tried it on a friend. Loved it. So let me see what you think. Steve, are you ready for my joke? I'm ready. What do you call a red-faced lawyer? Go on, I've no idea. What? Tell me, Dev, what do you call a red-faced lawyer? An embarrister. Get it? Because uh, 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 he's embarrassed. Yeah, embarrassed. Like, yeah, embarrassed. yeah, red yeah, bar- yeah, yeah. Embarrassed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Anyway, what you got on the podcast? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I was me. just... Um, what you yeah, got on yeah. the podcast? <laughs> I'm quite happy with that, right? <laughs> you, you, there's been better ones from you. There's been better uh, ones from Steve, you. Steve, talk to me about last week's BT Sports show, Daniel Dubois' firefight with Richard Larty. What did you make of it all? He would have learned a lot in that fight, for sure. But did he need to do all that bravado, machismo? Maybe it was um to show a message to the big rivals he's got in the Frank Warren stable now, Joe Joyce and, of course, um, who's become an old rival now, Nathan Gorman. Um, it was tremendously exciting. He didn't need to do that stuff. He, he come through a, a chin check and got the visitor out the way in the end and, and won in style. But um, it was an exciting fight. People watching on BT and at Wembley Arena loved it. So um, it's added to his popularity for sure. But what was quite amusing, when he was standing there and just exchanging blows with scant regard yeah. for defence was Frank Warren's face in the front <laughs> row there. It wasn't a happy one, was it? He was terrified. I was terrified as well. You sort of watch it, you know, with your, your hands in front of your eyes kind of thing, just kind of peeking through and saying, please, please don't land Big Richard Larty, because Larty meant business. Once he made it over to the country, you know, long story, but once he made it over to the country, he was talking about coming for Dubois' head and how Frank was trying to block his visa and all just eat. He, he was crazy in fight week. He, he, he come over and he gave it and got and, and, and pulled Dubois into that fight. Now, Dubois, well, when I say he'll learn from that fight, he'll learn there are situations in, there are situations in boxing where you need to go to war. There's situations when you don't. And he'll learn from that when's the right and when's the wrong time to stand and have a trade up in the middle of the ring. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I actually asked him afterwards. I got, got to see Dubois afterwards. I said, did he hurt you? And his sister was close by as well. And he just sort of, he started laughing at me, almost like sort of mugging me off. Like, oh, did he hurt me? And like looking at his sister for like, oh, he's like, he's asking, did he hurt me sort of thing. But I can confirm that he didn't get hurt by any of those massive lasty blows. That's that's what he's saying. And uh, I was foolish to ask, it would appear. Maybe you were <laughs> foolish to ask. I saw the picture of you and him, so he was quite sweet with you anyway, it yeah. sounds. But um, you know, you know, it's funny you mentioned his sister there. Mm. And the only time I ever really see him laugh and look a bit relaxed is when he's in her company he really is he warms to people more i think around her and when she you know she's around or she's mentioned you know they're, they're close those two that's true yeah they are and she's a talent herself T- talk to me about the uh, the other boys on the show then Any, anyone stand out for you for me i, I thought sunny edwards his uh his stoppage was was quite brilliant his whole performance yeah he gets better and better you know he lives the life up at that gym in, in Sheffield you know he's moved away from everything to be in Sheffield and live he lives in that gym he's just getting better and better I, I, you know I am looking forward to when you know he comes down to to fly weight because that's the weight for him mm-hmm. um, if you if you do look at the, the champions that like fly weight that they're, they're pretty much we say an elite bunch when you look at the new W is it is one Frank Francisco Estrada I think is a new WBC champion so that's a super fly isn't it super yeah. fly where he's fighting yeah. at the moment um Yerwin and, and Kayasu we got on Box Nation this weekend is the brilliant IBF champion yeah. you know you've got Khaled Liafai the WBA champion from Birmingham we'd think is possibly he could beat and we've got a really good WBO super flyweight fight coming up in June between Aston Felicity, I think, and Kazuto Ioko, who's already a three-weight world champion at minimum light fly and fly. So, you know, that's, that's a good bunch there. And down at fly, they're, 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 the fly boys are pretty good. But I think 
We'll see him even better at flyweight, and I'm I'm excited for him. We also had Lerone Richards, and yeah. he was better than what he has been in the past. You know what I think he showed the other night. He wasn't fluent, you know, and brilliant over the whole duration of the fight, but we saw more glimpses than we have for a long time that he could be for real. And do you know what? I know it's a fight that's not going to be made at the moment. I can see why he gave Chris Eubank Jr. nightmares in, in sparring. His style is wrong for Eubank. Yeah, you can you can see it now. He was he was pretty good. Once once he got going, once he warmed into the fight, uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed that Lerone Richards performance. And you can see why people have been speaking so highly about him. Sniper the boss came out looking like a wasp, and, and actually a little bit like Sniper the wasp with a, <laughs> with those shorts on. It was quite something. Well, anyway, this week this week's show we hear from British boxing hero Ricky Hatton. We've got Harley Ben on the show, the son of the legendary Nigel Ben. We hear from Boy Jones Jr. who is manning up. And we look ahead to what's coming up in the boxing world. So keep us in your ears and enjoy another week of the Boxing Podcast. Well, let's start with the hitman this week. Ricky Hatton's gym up in Hyde is becoming a bit of a British boxing hotbed. He's already had Nathan Gorman and Tommy Fury in there, amongst others. He's now got Tyson Fury and Billy Joe Saunders up there. So Steve popped up to the gym and had a bit of a chin wag with the hitman. Rick, uh, always seems to attract big names to your gym and Billy Joe Saunders is here training. Uh, what's it like having a character like Bill around? It is, to be honest with you, you know, you know, Tyson's a larger than life character. I think uh, I can put a joke across every now and again and Billy's exactly the same and um, it's great, it's great to have him in the gym and it's great to see him looking so well. I had a bit of bad luck in recent times, but you know, with um, his weight division with the, you know, so many big fights on the horizon for him there, it's nice to see him in such good shape, looking well, happy. Uh, and it's like the old days for me when I was back in Billy Graham's Phoenix camp. There used to be me and Michael Gomez and Bobby Rimmer and Stephen Bell, you know, real characters. And um, as hard as this game is, training in the gym, and it is hard, you know, none of no one works harder than the lads in this gym, whether it be Tyson, Billy or my boys. But you've got to try and make it a bit fun with a smile on your face. And believe you me, it's, it most certainly is with Billy Joe in the gym. How do you think Bill will do if he go, stays at super middleweight at that new division? Billy's well, right there, they're knock, knocking on the door, aren't they? I mean, ideally, you know, if Billy can have a few regular regular fights, get his sharpness back, get his get his stock raised, do you know what I mean, and stuff like that, you know. And I think it's just the right, you know, the right timing for Billy. It's, it's the perfect weight division to, to be in at the minute because so many big fights are, are happening and Billy's right there on the course and we hope he can get a few regular fights and get the big ones he deserves now. He's in a good place, he's happy. And, you know, he's, he's not many miles on the clock, so it's, it's all about <coughs> timing, do you know what I mean? And, and the right fights at the right time, and I think this could be the right time for him. Uh, another big fight coming up, Josh Warrington against Kid Galahad. What's your uh, opinion of that fight and who do you think wins? It's a very, very good fight. And you've got to heap all the praise on, on Josh Warrington, do you know what I mean? You know, he was an underdog against Selby, come through and he won it. And, you know, when you, fighters are judged on how good a champion they are you know, by the champions and the fighters they face. You know, he beat Lee Selby, he was an underdog, you know, fought Cal Frampton, another, you know, multiple weight world world champion, you know. And Kid Galahad now straight in again, he's another another um, quality fighter. You know, and I used to go down to the Winker Bank gym, you know, with, with Zanat Zakianov, who was the former world bantamweight champion. And he used to spar with Kid Galahad, and I tell you what, that fella can fight. And you know what I mean? So you've got to take your hat off to Josh Warrington. You know, he's he's fought Selby, he's fought Frampton. He's not picking another easy option against Kid Galahad. It really is a tough fight. But I think since he's become the champion, Josh, um, I think he's warm to it. I think his confidence has gone up. I think he's slipped another couple of gears. And to come off that, you know, that fight, you won't see many better fights in the British boxing ring than the, the Warrington-Frampton fight. So he's on the, you know, the, the crest of a wave. His confidence is up. So while your confidence is up, you might as well fight these the people like Kid Gallard because you know your confidence needs to be up when you're fighting people like this. Who wins the fight? Uh, I would like, I like to think Josh Warrington. I think he's very, 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 very clever. He's got a very, very high work rate. He doesn't leave you alone. You know, against Cal Frampton. You know, Cal Frampton had the better boxing ability. He was a good judge of distance and stuff like that. 
But, you know, Josh took that away from him. You know, what you do with, you know, fighters that have maybe more talent than you, you take, you take the talent away by bullying them, rushing them, having the right tactics, keeping on top of them. And I think he'll have to apply similar tactics to, to Kid Galahad. Kid Galahad's very, very talented. You know, and the thing is, though, when, you know, Carl was very good at, you know, judging the distance and, you know, when, you know, when the fighters are stood in front of him, he can pull in range, he can pull out of range and pick him off. And that's why Josh never stood in front of him, you know, coming at different angles and very, very clever, you know, very clever. He's got a very good boxing brain between his ears and he'll need it against Kid Galahad. But I think the fact that he's got a good boxing brain, you know, him and his team and his dad seem to get the tactics right. You know, they, they definitely know what they're doing. And Kid Galahad is very, very talented, but you know what I mean? Sometimes the people with the most talent don't win. It's about having the right tactics and the right game plan. And Josh always seems to get that right. So I think I'd just pick Josh ever so slightly. But trust me, this is, this is, as, this is as tough as they come. Well, Steve, good to hear from Ricky Hatton, the hitman as ever. Great way to start the show. Tell me, you're, you're up there you know, pretty much every, every week now. Well, what's the vibe like up there? Yeah, I've popped into the gym a couple of times. And one thing it's always been is a happy gym. You know, Ricky Hatton knows when it's time to have a bit of a laugh and a joke with his fighters. And he knows when it's time to train them and crack on. And then when the session finishes, the jokes are aplenty. And I've been up there, I think, twice. I've been up there when Billy Joe Saunders has been there for this training camp. And he's really settled. He's in that environment. He's really happy. And I think... Being around people like Ricky, who are pretty relaxed, laid back, as in his as is his own trainer Ben Davison, is bringing the best out of Ricky. He's very happy up there, and he's you know you think now he's been up there for seven weeks, and I don't I think he went home for for one night oh, during the seven weeks. Yeah, so the, like a big kind of jokey environment when they're not working. You you you're up there laughing at their jokes, were you, Steve? Well, you know what? I want to. I want to. Oh, I think instead of me going there for the next interview, you should go out there, get in the you ring, should. get a mic, and do a stand-up routine. I think so and, because and yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll have a clapometer and, <laughs> and see what sort of claps you get for your jokes. But um, the barrister one, I would um, save that for another audience. Yeah, I get it, Steve. You laugh at their jokes. You don't laugh at mine. You're trying to fit in with the cool kids. Well, you're you're not, Steve. You're not Billy Joe Saunders. You you're not Tyson Fury. You're not Ricky Hatton. You, you're you know. You, you should laugh at my jokes. Try a funnier one next week and you might yeah. get a crack out of Lillis. 6-0 Harley Ben returns to action on May 18th on the Billy Joe Saunders vs. Chef at Isufi show from Stevenage FC. Now he's of course the son of British boxing great Nigel Ben and he's had a bit of a rocky relationship with his dad and his brother Connor. But he seems a man rejuvenated now and he's raring to go. Here he is with Richard Hubbard at a special box clever session at Stevenage ABC from earlier this week. You're here at Stevenage ABC, you've been doing a little bit of work on behalf of Box Clever, working with working with some kids, spreading the gospel of boxing. How was it? Yeah, it was really good, you know, it was good to engage with the kids and, and things like that because I'd never had an amateur career myself, so it was good to and they was all passionate, which you don't really see well in this day and age kids are only sort of passionate about their phones sort of thing so it was good to see kids that were passionately boxing and and they was itching to get in the ring so it was good to see yeah can you relate to it is this something you would have lapped up as a youngster yes i would have but i never sort of got introduced to it even though i come from a boxing family i was more football i wish i'd found boxing at a younger age i mean how polite the kids were here is it's, it's good to see well, that's the whole thing about boxing and introducing young kids to boxing is because it does bring that discipline it makes people humble it makes people mix with all elements of the community and, and it's so important especially in today's climate of course there was all different ages boys girls and that didn't matter at all do you know what i mean everyone wanted to get in the ring and, and show what they got and and try and it was really good and what i noticed was Normally, if you're going somewhere full of kids at that age, there's talk about Instagram and, and Twitter and things like that. No, I didn't hear it once, honestly. I was really surprised. Everyone just wanted to put their gloves on and box. It was really good. Yeah, I thought they would be filming it as they go along. That's what I thought. I thought people were going to be taking selfies every time. But no, it was good. They was, they was focused and it's box clever's really good and it's a good scheme. I think, I mean, boxing changed my life massively I was on I was on the wrong path badly um, due to a football injury it gave me depression and I started smoking drinking and hanging around with the wrong people but I know if I had boxing in my life earlier I may not have taken that path 
But when I found boxing, it put me back on the right path and has kept me there. So, were you diagnosed with depression? No, I wasn't diagnosed with it. Do you know what? I didn't. I didn't see a doctor about it. It was just more. I say depression. Maybe depression. Well, no, it is the right word. It is. I was depressed because I, football was my life, and it got taken away from me. I didn't even do my injury in football. I was playing on a little scooter and snapped my ankle in half. So yeah, it was a, it was a bad time for me. Where were you footballing at the time? I was, I just left Arsenal development and then I was playing for Wolfham Cross. So you you did fine, but you spiralled into a dark place once your sort of dream had been taken away from you. Yeah, one hundred percent. It was. I was like, oh, well, what do I do now? I had a cast on for three months. It was a bad break, so I had a free stone cast on my leg, and I couldn't. It wasn't one I could walk around on crutches. I was literally bed bound for just over two months and then they changed my cast but put me in a bad place I mean imagine being in your bedroom for two and a half months put put people in a bad place do you know what I mean so I didn't channel that in the right way I started smoking I started when my leg was better I started going out drinking because I knew I couldn't play football so what else was there to do and I think at that age of sort of 14 15 you can be easily led basically what I'm trying to get at is boxing really did save me from doing stupid stuff and it took you a while to come round to boxing, though, didn't 100%, it? One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I was in that sort of bad place for about four to five years, so it wasn't like a, a little phase. It was a big chunk of my teenage years. I was in doing the wrong things, and it wasn't till eighteen, nineteen, that I decided to put some gloves on and, and crack on with it. I mean, it was a little dabble at white collar boxing first, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I say it was more sort of gym spars kind of thing, like not no ticket sales or anything like that it was just I didn't even want to do it as a, as, a, as a career when I started I was just doing it to get me out of the place that I was in and it made me feel good doing boxing hitting the bag and things like that and then I was in the gym for about a year with Ben and the boys and got beat up for about 18 months every day and then decided to uh, to, to progress on and, and make my pro debut I remember talking to you back ahead of your debut and it's remarkable looking at you now but you were getting ready to campaign as a super middleweight. I had two fights as super middleweight and I don't know why. It was because I was fat, that's why. And I didn't diet properly and it was all getting used to it though and I still I hate dieting to this day. It's my, I absolutely hate it but it's got to be done because you've got to be in good condition. And But yeah, I can mean, I look at some super middleweights now. I mean, look at Callum Smith or something like that. I'm, I'm only five foot ten so I would have been, yeah, it wasn't the right weight and now I'm um, moving down to, to Welter and see how I get on there. How long did it take the penny to drop to realise that you need to buckle down and it's all about getting your weight and your discipline and everything else? If you look, I had a long layoff, between, like about nine months between my second and my third fight. And if you look at my second fight, my fight looks literally like two completely different people. You could say to someone, that's two different people and they wouldn't tell you it's not. I think then I realised, because my first fight, I managed to stop him in the start of the second round. Um, but my second fight went a distance and it was I got hit a few times so I was like oh that was not nice I was I remember literally feeling so sick after because I was so knackered but I think it was because of the extra weight I was carrying I was carrying more than a stone that I didn't need to so I thought right it's time to crack on now this game's hard how do you feel you developed as a fighter now because I mean not being rude but obviously you were, didn't have the most finesse when you first started no of course I don't think I had in my, in, in my debut I don't think I showed one bit of skill if I want genuinely I was just loading up on punches every punch I threw took so much out of me because I was just trying to knock him out and do you know what I wouldn't like that I, I, I stopped him with like a flurry of 20 punches and I don't know what would happen if he had to come back at me after them 20 punches honestly I was ready to hit the deck I was knackered yeah it was there was no skill but on May the 18th I'm fighting I genuinely believe I'm going to display a very skillful performance and people are going to see that I'm very serious about this and I can mix with the best in this country in the next few years. I was just going to come to that. You are May 18th at Stephen FC on the undercard of Billy Joe Saunders v Shifa Asufi. It's a return to a big show for you yeah. because you've sort of been sort of learning your craft a little bit on the small hall circuit recently. Yeah, I mean, my first two, they were at York Hall and the Brentwood Centre, so it wasn't massive, but they was on TV on Box Nation, so they were packed out. And then I've been on small hall, 
which I've appreciated because I've been learning my craft and, and things like that. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would have been ready for, for big, massive shows um, at that stage. But now I'm honestly ready to, to go and showcase. And I believe I'm someone that does better under pressure. And the pressure of the the cameras, the big crowd, the big stadium, I think that will all be in my favour because it was just like going back to my football. If I played a better team, I would play better. And the opponents that they've got in mind for me, they're not easy opponents. So, Going back to when you said you were sort of trying to blast people out, particularly in your first fight, did you feel any pressure in relation to your name, your father, the fact that he was known as such an explosive character yeah. who literally, I mean, he got, he's got a showreel of KOs. Did yeah. that bring his own pressure for you? It did in my first fight, yeah, and I think I thought about that far too much because it's not me, that's not, that's, I tried to be like that and, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've got power and my first fight, I don't think it was power that stopped the guy, if I'm honest with you, I just think it was over, being overwhelmed him. My second fight, I displayed a bit of power um, with a knockdown, but now I really believe I'll be able to execute power and skill all in all in this fight. So, yeah, but it did. Going back, sorry, going back to your beat, it did. Um, I did have pressure on me. Well, I, no one was really putting it on me. I was putting it on myself. Mm. It was a talking point, wasn't it? Yeah, and. Um, I remember seeing, looking on Twitter the day before, let's see if he's like his dad and things like that. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Need that. Yeah. yeah, I need that, don't I? And, um, but no, I have a completely different style to my dad. I mean, there's things, movements, mannerisms in the ring that look like my dad. But we, I think me, my, I've got my brother fights as well. Um, and I think we all are different. Talk to me about change of trainer. What? What's the catalyst for that? Um, first, I just want to say a massive thank you to Lenny Butcher, who um, got me to 5-0. and So I was with him from the start of my, my career to fight five. Um, I don't know, do you know what it was? I just thought I, I fancied a change up. I, I feel that I needed to work harder. Not that Lenny wasn't working me hard, just I just wanted to switch it up and learn more things. And I think because I hadn't had that experience of going to different gyms before, I'd only been in one place. Honestly, it's done me the world of good. The world of good, which is taking like I said, no disrespect to Lenny at all. I love Lenny, and he'll be he'll be a friend for life. But I'm now training out of Fort Galaxy Gym. Um, I train at Ade and Terry Dunstan, and they've brought me on leaps and bounds. Honestly, I see a massive difference in myself. I didn't want to be stagnant. Do you know what I mean? I wanted to change it up again. I wanted to take myself out of my comfort zone because I started getting into a comfort zone. I knew how I'd be sparring every week. I knew what I'd be doing and I wanted to take myself out of my comfort zone and I have done. And I think that's good for a boxer because you can be taken out of your comfort zone in the first 30 seconds of a round. Don't mind me saying, you look like you're in a good place at the moment. You sort yeah. of got a lot more, well, I don't know, a bit more maturity about you, a yeah. calmness. Has kind of making things right with your brother had something to do with that? Yeah, I mean, as people know, me and my dad and my brother have had rocky relationship for all of my life. and. It's good. At the end of the day, they're family. I've said some childish things. My brother said some childish things. But we haven't really done anything wrong to each other. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just... It's been all talk, isn't yeah, it? Interviews and... Literally. <laughs> Pettiness. Obviously, there was reasons why we didn't get on personal stuff. It was all petty. And now me and my brother, we get on really well. And, and we support each other. He was at my last fight. And it was good to have him there. And You've got to look at it in the way, but your dad's in Australia. You've got your mum here, but together you're going to be stronger, aren't you? Of course, of course, we're, we're family and we only live 10 minutes down the road from each other. Why not? Make a difference to your outlook? Do you know what, I feel more at peace, um, just, just, just with myself and just with life. And like people will say, I think a happy fighter is a more dangerous fighter. So I'm sure that on May the 18th, it, it will be my best performance. And yeah, because of the boxing and the training that I'm doing, but where I'm at mentally as well. Steve, that was quite a listen, but let, let me ask you this. Boxing history is littered with fighting sons. You look at you know, Marvis Frazier, Floyd and Floyd Mayweather, you know, and the, the Eubanks. Tell me, how difficult do you think it is to carry on the family name? If your dad's been a great fighter, you know, and you haven't got the mentality, it can become a, a horrible strain on you. And I think there's, there's signs that Harley Ben, for example, is starting to cope 
a bit better. He's pretty much, you know, a stranger with his dad. He has been on and off. I don't know what the relationship is at the moment. And, you know, there was good and bad being said in the build-up to it, to his first fight. And he only recently reunited with Conor Ben. Um, yeah. where there was quite a rocky relationship, his half-brother. So you know, maybe there's a sign that he's starting to cope with it a bit better th- than what he has been. But the pressures it's br- it can bring it is crazy. And I'll never forget one, maybe not so much well-known to mainstream boxing public, but Steve Foster Sr. from Manchester and his dad, oh, his yeah. son, Steve Jr. Now, Steve Jr. seemed to live with the pressure quite well, pretty quiet kid, so, you know, he wouldn't get on top. But it was the dad who struggled with his son in training him. He trained him for a few fights, said, um, no more, I can't do any more. Oh, right. In, and um, stop training him. So he, he just couldn't, he found it too hard, the emotional side working with his son. It, it, become, it become too hard. And then, you know, I, 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 I speak to boxers who, and I don't want to name them, and I know one ex-boxer who's just had a son. And so he's to try and keep, he can't stop his son boxing. So what he does, he's moved all his boxing trophies out the front room and they're not on show in the house. Wow, it's because he, he doesn't, doesn't want to encourage his son to him. become a boxer. The, the pressures it puts on, on sons, it depends on their mentality. I mean, someone like Floyd Mayweather had that hot and cold relationship w- mm. with his dad and um, all, all throughout their career. And they got together at the end shortly after um, his dad, Floyd Mayweather, stopped training Ricky Hatton. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult for him. You know, you name Marvis and Joe Frazier. Fancy having Joe Frazier as your dad. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, U, the Eubank ones, we, we've seen it where the dad's made the story more about him. And whereas we've had the Danny Garcia one where he made, the dad made the story about him early in Danny Garcia's career. But a lot of that was to take the pressure off his son. You know, yeah. it really, really did work that, you know, that sort of thing when he was upcoming fighter. Um, you know, you're seeing Danny Jr. come more to the fore. You know, you've had some where... Where it's really worked. Leon Spinks was a world heavyweight champion, one of the biggest upsets ever against Muhammad Ali. And his son Corey went and won the IBF. I think it was IBF world weight champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then he lost it to Zab Judah, wasn't he? Was it it's Zab the same Peter, guy, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah. No, it's it's an it's an interesting interesting thought because I was thinking, you know, this, all this pressure put on the son, and you know, his dad was a boxer. You look at someone like Floyd Mayweather. Where, it just didn't, didn't affect him, you know. Look, look what he's gonna and done. Um, yeah, I think I think it flags up, you know, when fighters do, don't handle it as well. I think it flags up more so when young fighters are struggling to make the impact when something's been expected. I mean, you, there's going to be one in the next year that's going to get a lot of publicity when Ricky Hatton's son, yeah, Campbell turns over. I mean, that that's going to be pressure because. Ricky Hatton wasn't just one a great fighter. He was Britain's most popular fighter ever. The numbers speak for itself in what mm-hmm. he took abroad. Now, that taking 35,000 to Las Vegas speaks for your popularity in my book. You know, Absolutely. even after he'd lost fights, he was attracting 60,000 people to the city of Manchester Stadium. That's popularity. And a lot of those people that followed Ricky weren't necessarily hardcore boxing fans. They were blokes you're meek in the street. So they'll be saying to Campbell, ah, oh, I remember your dad boxing. So even to get reminded of that, Every single day when he walks around the area of Manchester, he comes from, oh, so I was going to your fight. Oh, I wonder if you'd be as good as your dad, because he'll be on the streets out there. It's good. Yeah, I don't know what the plan is with regards to Campbell turning pro, if that is something on their mind. But I'm sure you know, if and when he does, he's going to be a big star, at least you know, for that pro debut. That, that's going to be a lot of fanfare in that in Manchester. Ricky Hatton's son turning pro. Imagine that. Goodness yeah. me. I mean, it will be. And I, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm guessing. I mean, he's, 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 he's got a, I'm told he's got a very much a pro style. Mm-hmm. He does a lot of training with his dad and with his uncle, Matthew Hatton. You know, you, I'm not privy to anything, but you, you'd imagine they're honing him for when he turns professional. Now, whether Ricky will train him or whether it'll be Matthew or both of them, I don't know. But he does work with his uncle, Matthew and his dad. Well, back on Harley Ben, you've, you've met Harley Ben, I'm sure, a few times. What are your impressions of, of this young man? As a person, I really like him. I mean, he's a very pleasant kid. He's a, he's a really good talker. So professionally, as a journalist, I've enjoyed being in his company. Now, as a fighter, I wasn't impressed early doors. I've got to, I've got to put my hands up. I mean, I saw, 
you know, the first fight with, with, with Dominic Zubku, he got the win. And I remember that second fight against Paul Cummings at Brentwood that we had on Box Nation. Now, yeah. Paul isn't, you know, he gets in the ring, he's a tough man, and he, you know, another one who leaves it in there. But, you know, he rarely wins. But that night, Harley was flat to the balls to beat somebody like that. And I thought, whoa. But since then, you know, he had about nine, ten months off after that fight. And he's got better and better in the last four fights. There's a long, long way to go, Dev. And I'm not going to start saying we're talking of a future champion here. But what, what, what I think you've got to say in his favour is that he's improving with every single fight. He's improving and he's knuckling down. All the report cards are telling us that Harley Ben is knuckling down now and, you know, really getting on with it. But something you mentioned there, his second fight, I think it was, against Paul Cummings. Go and look that up because Paul Cummings, I don't know if he's still in action, he I is. think he has, he has the longest neck I've ever seen in boxing. What do yeah. you think? Talk to me. You know what, I, I, I remember <laughs> that fight and he has. He most probably has, yeah. Paul. Huge. He, so, he, so much. Yeah, he's, he's still boxing, definitely. I've seen his reports. I'm not sure what his record is now. I'd imagine he must be getting close to 40, 50 fights or something now. Yeah, well, Harley Ben is back in action on May 18th at the Lamex Stadium, home of Stevenage FC. On the undercard of Billy Joe Saunders against Shefat Esufi, Joe Joyce against Ustinov. you got Brad Foster in there against Ashley Lane. It's really racking up that show. And also, another young man on that show, well, you could say he's a boy, although he wants to be treated as a man, but called a boy. It's lovable lightweight and former Southern Area champion Boy Jones Jr. Now, Richard Hubbard popped in to see him last week, and this really is boy like you've never heard him before. We're at the iBox gym, Bromley, with a slightly unfamiliar face to what we're used to seeing here, Boy Jones Jr. Now, you're now a resident of the iBox gym. Yeah, no, I'm loving it down here. Um, they've took me under their wing and... Uh... Yeah, I really f uh, f thank you for them for having me down here, but it's really good, Jimmy. You know? You've got a lot of champions and things like that. You've got loads of boys down here, and it's, it's really good down here. I really, and uh, to be honest, they're all roughly around my age, so it's banter's really funny down here, all the boys. Now then, I know it's difficult to talk about, but <clears throat> I've asked a lot of fighters over the years, and it's nothing unique to you. You had to make the decision to change trainer. You, you've you've done it. You were with um, Dom Negus for a long time. Now you, you're coming to train here. I mean, was it awkward for you uh yeah it's uh it's i don't think uh it's never not awkward is it because you like i, I was with dom for uh, about four or five years weren't i uh but sometimes you need a change in it and uh sometimes a change can do bad for you but sometimes a change can be good for you and uh to be honest a lot of people have been telling me he's brought the best out of me i've been starting to box a bit more and using my feet looking different in the gym uh different in the gym inspiring and that uh like, i mix change my style massively uh, Mickey Burke, who I'm with now, uh, but down the box as well. Um, I'm more of a boxer. You know, th that's where, this is the reason why I come down to his gym because I, I like the styles like Bradley Skeet, Lerone Richards, and all that. I like using my jab and that. As also, you know, with my career, like I've never had an amateur career, mm -hmm. but I think they, this was the right move for me because of how they all box and be flash slick and that. I love all that slick style and all that. Uh, so they've changed my style massively and yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying training, I've got the love back a bit as well. I went through a little stage of not enjoying the sport. I didn't really want to do it. My mum and my missus were beating me up saying, no, come on, you've got to get back into it. But to be honest, Mick's done really well, um, weaning me back into it and yeah, just to get me back in the gym and then yeah, well, I'm here now. You know? <laughs> it's a chance when you make a change, but for somebody to have a fresh look at your abilities, to look at the raw materials and maybe look at a slightly different way of employing them. Yeah, no, like um, obviously my style was like sit on the shots. I thought like I, I, I used to fight like a, smart, a small fighter, didn't I? I used to come to try to come walk you down, hands up and that. And to be honest, it doesn't do really good for your head, does it? I've, I've always wanted a box. I've always wanted to be on my jab and that. And I've learned so much. It feels like it's going back to school. Like the first day of training, I went back to Jasmine, my uh, fiance, and I was like, Jazz, I can't believe it. I really loved it. She went, What do you mean? And I was like, I can't believe what they've taught me. I really can't. And like, I was so happy. I, and then every day I come back, even though it's a trek for me, it's worth it, to be honest, to learn what I'm learning. It's really fun and it's really bringing out the best in me. I know everyone's saying you can't really start your full career again, but. I can. I, I'm, I'm. I'm starting my career again, and it's. It's really. It's. It's really fun. Like I ain't had an amateur crew, uh, amateur fight. I had all on license, and I, I learned. I have learned the hard way. I'm 22 years old. Maybe if I'd done it later on in my career, I couldn't learn. Like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. They say, but 
I'm learning loads and my style's changing. All the boys are saying to me, come up to me every day, oh, Ben, you're looking forward to your fight again and that. And it's, re it's really nice and I'm really enjoying it and I'm loving life at the moment. So you're still playing that daft card, are you? And I mean, I know for a fact you're not as daft as you like to make out. Oh, you've played on that, haven't you? You know what? Mick and Alan sit down and sat down with me and said, look, this boy looks got to stop. You've got to, like, I've got a kid now. I've got a son, believe it or not. You can't be stupid in this sport and I've got to start using my brain. I am a smart kid, believe it or not. But to be honest, I've... It's like a get out of jail free card being thick, like pretending to be dumb and that. Like people don't talk too much. That's why I really do it. Like I can get away with being stupid. I'm, I'm an, I want to. Well, I'm growing up. I'm, I'm want to get an house with my son and stuff like this. I'm this get, like boxing. You can't play with boxing. So I'm just this. This is me being. I'm re. I'm rebranding myself. I'm, I'm, I'm Ben now. I'm not playing the boy card no more. Now, you touched on it. I was going to take you back a little bit where you sort of said about getting really down in the dumps and ready to jack it in. Now, you mentioned before, but as a consequence, perhaps, of your party in the ways of a trainer, it cost you your sponsors and things like that. So it's a real sort of hardship and sacrifice you've had to make making your way over here financially and everything. To be honest, I, I don't like playing on the card. I ain't saying I was that, like, was, like, suffering... I, loads of things happened at once for me. Um, obviously, the trainer, the sponsors. I was going to lose my flat. Loads of things happened, and it was like my son was not well in and out of hospitals. It caused me and my missus to argue. I had to find work, couldn't find work, and this and that. And just loads of things happened at once. And you know what? I, I didn't. And lose it and change. I think changing the trainer as well. A lot of people don't want to talk to me no more. Like all my old friends and that. It's it's it's, it's a lot of politics behind it all. And it, well, I, w I was a bit lonely in my head and, uh, and stuff like that. My mum was trying to talk to me and I didn't want to talk to no one. Did, my, that's why me and my missus was arguing, fell out a little bit because I weren't talking. Because I don't like talking about what's going on. Like, and I was a bit embarrassed about the month because like, I've always, like, with, because Jazz is on maternity leave while she's just finishing. And I was a bit embarrassed, not could, couldn't pay the rent and this and that. And it was just, it was just, it was just embarrassing for a, for a man, well, a dad saying I can't pay the rent and stuff like this. And it was just, to be honest, the boy Bradley Skeet, I've got a shout out to me, helped me out massively. Money, like I don't want to say it, but he helped me out with money, uh, clothes. He gave me some hand me downs from his uh, old clothes. Uh, Mickey was um, paying for my, he's paying for my meals as well from Athletes Kitchen. Um, he's giving some clothes to my son as well, like loads of things, loads of people, Alan's helping me out, uh, like down here, um, just loads of things, I, like, I ain't got sponsors, but all my brothers, my mum, my brothers who are giving me money, they're sponsoring me, my family's are sponsoring me, believe it or not, my close friends, Jack, Ashley and that, they're all giving me money so I can make it down here, and I really appreciate, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed with good friends, I'd say. I'm re I really am, and I've, it really shocked me how many from my friends like would help me, saying, Ben, I'll give you this to, like, obviously I've got to pay them back. <laughs> they're investing in you, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, no, and I really, I really, I hope they realise how much they're doing for me, because I'll get to come down there, perform, and then later on, when I fight, I'll get to provide for my family, and I really appreciate my friends and my mum, Jazz, even Jasmine, Jasmine's been buying all the uh, food and that. Like, it's, it's a bit embarrassing for the the man of the ass not can't provide for the fact a lot for my for my kid. But you know what though, this could end up being the making of you, wouldn't it? To go through this hardship, and as you just sort all the compartments out in your life, which ones are worth persevering with, which ones aren't, and almost have a start a clean break and start again and it's probably a great opportunity to do that it's a bit like that film Hitch I'd say you know when he really had everything and then this big money thing happened you know what everyone's saying oh it's all going to get better it's going to get better it's going to get better to be honest I had my wallet nicked today or <laughs> yesterday my son was in hospital the weekend but it's slowly getting better and better like sl things are slowing down but everything just hit me at once and I just thought oh I just can't be bothered for this I really can't like I was but to be honest, I'll just thank everyone just for helping me out and looking after me. But I'll, things are getting better. Like Andy Ailey, my manager, is proper look at, like is helping me out as well. I can't thank him enough. Uh, well, you've actually come from being the boy prodigy, where everything was going one way. You know, you had a major promoter. You know, you were you were flying. You didn't have to work. You had decent sponsors. You probably thought he's on easy street. Those sort of things are never going to last. You're always going to find the real world sooner or later. But to be honest. I've always struggled, like me and my mum and my, all my brothers have struggled as a kid, so it's it's second nature to me. But obviously we got it easy. Like, listen, you're given, like, I was 18 years, 18 years old, I was fighting on these big cards, I was enjoying life. Yes, I was enjoying life, but 
I was still humble in my head. I've never got big-headed. And I, I really thank for uh, Frank Warren for putting me on the big show still and sticking by me after all these like, things has happened. But, uh, yeah, no, you realise when you haven't got nothing, when you have something, you got to like, look after it a bit more and stuff like that. And, but, obviously, now I've got a son, so where any money I get is going towards him. I want to buy an house for him and stuff like that. I'm sure you will. I just want to take you back, unfortunately, to your last fight. It was a... Was it a WBO European a fight, a lightweight against Craig Evans? Yeah. I know you don't want to go into too much detail, but you weren't well in the build-up to that fight, and you probably really shouldn't have been in there. No, uh, yeah, I know. I, sh I shouldn't have been in there. Um, I needed to... That, that's, that's, that's my fault. I should have told people, but it's one of the things is it but to be honest like everyone thinks big about a loss it's a loss is a loss like Tottenham and Arsenal lose all the time they come back the next week and win the Champions League although no, actually they don't um, no disrespect bit to any exaggeration there yeah, ben. yeah a, bit, a bit disrespect to anyone in North London but yeah no nah, but listen I'm in life you learn so you don't lose you learn and you I learn from that fight no shame losing to Craig Evans I mean he's a seasoned seasoned campaigner isn't he he's been in with some you know real top boys yeah he's a top man like if I'm a kid that fought on their license I didn't think I was going to win the southern area I'm fighting for a WBO European title it's not a big title for most people but it's a big title for me so even just getting a chance and to be honest um another reason why I take that fight is I've got a chance for all my fa family to go out dressed really nice it was on that big show, um, dinner show yeah. the dinner show they all got suited up they enjoyed the night to be honest I was happy at that because all my family got dressed up come watch me fight they was all in suits my mum loved it Jasmine loved it all my brothers loved it they get to see the man from the script I don't I'm not into music and that. I don't know his name but they got photos of famous people and that. I was happy with that it was, it's a learning curve, but it's one of them things. Boxing, everyone's what cares about all these paper, was it not records, but like keeping the O and stuff. But it doesn't matter. Like, come on, you lose, man up and go on again. March on. Look at Muhammad, how many league fights did Pacquiao and Muhammad Ali lose? A few. Bernard, Bernard Hopkins lost his first fight. Uh, what's the what's guy commentator? He Johnny lost, Nelson. He lost his first, five yeah, on five on a spin. So what? He got up and might become a world champion. So, like, there we go. Come on. Now then, finally, May 18th yeah. at Stevenage, uh, the Lamex Stadium. Nothing's really been confirmed at this stage. It probably has, but they're not telling us. But one thing we do know, you're going to be in a title fight, and that must be great news for you. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, um, we're, well, down this gym, that we always prepare hard. And, um, yeah, so we, we're ready for anything. Um, I can't wait to get out there. Um, I like, I've, I've always wanted to fight at a stadium. I can't wait for the... Uh, I'm looking forward to that. We're training hard. Um, so we've got good top sparring. Danny Carr, Sanji Zaho. Uh, uh, like, I've been sparring some top boys in that. Um, so, yeah, we were just ready for that. Going to see a new you in there? Yeah, we are. We are. We're going to see Man Jones Jr. No, we can't really call myself that. But, no, we definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning every day. Um, it's it's really enjoyable down here. Like you see that the boys train, they they train really seriously and little things like I, I've I've been taught how to throw a jab properly. Um, so we're gonna see a jab. Yeah, you're gonna see a jab. You're gonna see you're gonna see me a box for once. Like I'm like what Mickey's done for me. Like training, he's changed my style immensely. I was sparring the other day and he rang me up. He was like Ben. Like even all the boys down in the gym. That's a different boy, Jones Jr. I was like, oh well. <laughs> which is what I've been doing so what I've been learning so yeah well Steve this is another one isn't it just like Harley Ben you really want the likes of Boy Jones Jr to just do well don't you yeah look if you if you meet Boy Jones Jr and you don't like him I think you're the one with something wrong to you he's very warm very genuine very honest very open uh, likes to laugh and go back to the honesty and openness we saw that or heard that in that brilliant interview there from Richard Hubbard um, he split with Dominic Negus, which, you know, was a bit of a shock in boxing, given how close they were. But, you know, this happens a lot in boxing. Fighters move on, trainers move on. And he's now with Mickey Burke and at the iBox gym in uh, Bromley, where Alan Smith trains all these fighters. He seems very happy there. And uh, not only are we not going to be losing the boy, we're going to see a new new Ben Jones in the ring at Stevenage when he boxed with, the, you know, judging by the stuff 
that they've taught him. And, we, you know, you know, the boys who train at the eye box. A lot of it is about boxing and silky skills more than showing you can have a fight that um, Boy Jones, Ben Jones, whatever we're going to call him now, prefers <laughs> to be known as. But I really hope it works for him, the move to the eye box, Jim. There's a lot of lovely people at that gym. And he's the sort of kid who will get a lot of love from those people because he is so genuine. Yeah, great place for him. And we're looking forward to seeing what impact this new trainer, you know, the new people around him, looking forward to seeing what impact that has on Boy Jones Jr. He's back in action on May 18th at Stevenage FC. That's a bit of a show there that's coming together. Of course, Billy Joe Saunders in against Chef Sufi for the interim WBO World Super Middleweight title. Joe Joyce is taking on uh, quite a late notice uh, opponent, quite a good for a late notice opponent in terms of Alexander Ustinov. He's taking him on in a couple of weeks. And of course, there's Brad Foster that's been added against Ashley Lane for the English title. We're looking forward to it. That's May 18th. It's going to be live on BT Sport. Now then, let's talk about Box Nation, the channel of champions. Schedule's starting to fill up a little bit, isn't it, Steve? Come on, talk to me. It's filling up. It's filling up, Dev. We've got a stacked week coming up. Um, well, we go off to California this this weekend. Stockton, Ooh. California is where the cameras w- w- are. I'm not sure where that is in California. I've got a feeling it's up near San Francisco. There we've got one of the Russian crushers, Arta Baturbiev. Mm. He defends his IBF light heavyweight crown against a, a, an American Bosnian, should we say, um, Reddy Voha. Kalaigic is how it's pronounced. Um, is that I... how it's pronounced, though, Steve? Is it? Radovoha. <laughs> <That's laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> Radovoha Kalaigic. Anyway, that's who he's fighting. I think he's the second defence of his IBF championship. But Sir BF, the only world champion in boxing with a 100% KO record in all his fights. So we know what to expect this weekend. But... The, you know, the, the Bosnian isn't the worst fight. I got a very bad decision against him in 2016 against Marcus Brown. who was robbed that night. Since then, he's had injury problems, but his last two fights, he's won and around and he's back. And um, also on that bill, someone we touched on at the top of the show, Jerwin Ankaihas, the uh, who's defending his IBF Super Flyweight Championship against his Japanese mandatory contender, Ryuchi Funai. And Funai is one of these guys who can neglect the fence. A lot, a lot, a lot of these Japanese um, fighters just plows forward and loves a tear up. Well, that should be a war. But what do we got from Monday on Box Nation? We got a week of wars. It's war week from Monday the 6th of May till Thursday the 9th. Four nights, four and a half hours of wars. 28 fights being shown in all. We got Lomachenko, Martinez, Sorcido, Zapovinia, which is a great fight. Belcher and Vargas. And of course, the fight that got Box Nation off to a cracking start way back in 2011. Liam Walsh against Appleby, Appleby. Yeah. yeah, what a fight that was. And um, we finished, the last fight we show is Andy Lee against Jackson on Thursday the 9th. Five rounds of mayhem and the most dramatic finish you could ever imagine. And then on the, the next night, the cameras are in London for ultimate box of three. One night, eight fighters, one night, all in the ring, having tear-ups at the end. One winner, and he goes on with a load of dosh. And on the Saturday, the 11th of May, we have a rematch of Miguel Burchell and Francisco Vargas, who delivered a brutal battle back in 2017. Ooh, Vargas, was st- Vargas was stopped on his feet in the 11th round, and Burchell, you know, become WBC super featherweight champion. And that's the fight that War Week is celebrating, because that will be a war, without a shadow of a doubt. Also on that bill, Isaac Dogbay attempts to win back the WBO Super Bantamweight Championship when he fights Emmanuel Navarrete, ah. uh, the man who outpointed him in an upset in um, that his most re- in his recent defence um, at the back end of last year. Well, question on that, Steve, just quickly: How do you feel about him going straight into the rematch with Navarrete? Is it is it the the thing to do? Should he have stepped away and uh, you know honed his craft a bit more, or, or what do you think of it all? Well, you, you thought he might have had an interim fight, but mm. 
at the end of the day, this be, he's been told this is when the rematch is. It's when the, the rematch is happening. And I hope, you know, he's been very quiet this time. I've been trying to track him down for a couple of weeks to come on the podcast. And I can't get his reply from mm-hmm. his people or anything. And usually they're so quick at offering him forward for interviews. Um, I'm not making excuses for the last fight. Navarati was the best man on the night, but it was absolutely madness. Dog Bay was training in Ghana one week, London the next week, America the next week. Then he was back in London with all different trainers. It was just madness the way he prepared for that fight. And um, he, he's, he, he's, got, he's got to bounce back because you, you, know, you think if he loses again, he's very much to the back of the queue. And, you know, a lot of a lot of world champions lose their titles, Dev, and they don't get a quick chance to win it back. He's got a great chance to win his title back. But I think you made a point the other week, and you may be right. Has Navarrete got his measure for good? That's what it feels like. It feels like one of those style make styles make fights kind of fights, and and maybe every time they fight, it will be Navarrete who comes out on top. But hopefully not. I'm a I'm a bit of a Dog Bay fan. He uh, follows me on Twitter. Little uh, little saying there for you, Steve. Does he follow you? He does, he does. He's a good uh, man. Isaac's a lovely kid. I mean, you know, he's a fantastic story. You know, though he flights, fights out of Ghana. London still lives in London, in Kennington. And just a real, you know, you've been around him. You've met him. A real charming kid. Yeah, he is indeed. He is indeed. So, yeah, loads coming up on Box Nation then. We're looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah, well, keep, keep us updated every week, Steve. I, I like hearing what's coming up on the Channel of Champions. Well, this Saturday night in Las Vegas is one of the most anticipated fights of the year. Canelo Alvarez and Danny Jacobs clash in a middleweight title unification. Tell me, Steve, where's your head at with this one? Outstanding fight, isn't it, Dev? It really is. My head, um, where it's been since day one, and I've been quite big since day one on this, is Sol Canelo Alvarez winning the fight. I just think he's just developed into a very, very good a good fighter, you know, in in recent times. I mean, I know there's the Golovkin controversies, but he's just, he's just getting better and better. I've just got, I've just got a feeling that has been, you know, one of the big selling points, or if you want to call it selling fights or side angle to this fight is that the judges are going to, are going to do him a big favor over 12 rounds. Now I think it goes 12 rounds, but I think there'll be little doubt at the end who, who, who's in command? I think he's. I think he. I think he, he's. A, he's a really intelligent fighter. I think his IQ's improved in the ring. His defence has got so much better. And you know, okay, there have been sort of you want to call them walkovers or the or the easier fights, we say Amir Khan, Wade Drain Chavez, and you know Liam Smith. But um, that that second fight against Golovkin. I, I think he, he he showed he was surreal. I know he's not everybody's favourite. I think there's question marks against Jacob's chin a little bit. You know, he has had shaky moments. Um, I don't think Canelo will stop him, but I think at the end of 12 rounds, he would have just worked enough and, and, be, and he'll be in a clear lead. I'm with you, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm a Canelo man here. Um, t- tell me about the Danny Jacobs. There's been talk about his punching power but then you you look at his last four fights have gone the distance so is he really that much of a punching you know has he got that much punching power look he, he hits hard i mean you know his power's got to be respective you know we've seen him put people away 29th you know people that i mean smaller guys but tough guys like you know sergio mora were put was put away a couple of times you know you know you had him down so, by the way yeah, Mora yeah, put did. him down and that's the, there's the questions about you know the chin you know Callum mm. Truax is, you know Truax is, is decent you know yeah. he, he he stopped good fighters you know we you know I think a lot rides on the what many people see as a robbery against Golovkin but uh, you look at the last three fights the Derry Vanchenko Selecki, Arias he's beat all them on points now you fancy Alvarez to stop a couple of them would you mm, maybe I don't know I don't, I don't think either of them are, are big monstrous no. punches you know. I think, yeah, OK, Alvarez might have impressed a bit more against them. Uh, I just fancy Alvarez strongly, and I have, I have since day one. What I love about Alvarez, and I might be turning back the clock here a bit when I talk about him, I can't, I can't stop thinking of that Floyd Mayweather fight. And it was way back in, it was nearly six, five and a half, six years ago now, mm-hmm. in September 2013. The second half of that fight, he wanted to be anywhere but the MGM Grand Garden ring, honestly. But since that fight, you know what? You went away and you thought, will he ever recover again? Because that was mentally, he was just done that night. He may have just abused him that night. You know, he played with him. And the way he's bounced back since then 
is nothing short of fantastic. And I've got nothing but um, praise for him. You know, I'm a big, big fan. You know, you can pick holes maybe in the rocky field in win, but that was just an exercise in stepping up to pick up a version of another world title. No big issue with that. Rocky got beat. He went home very well paid. And, you know, I think a lot of the stick he gets is unfounded. And I hope that after this fight on Saturday night, he's really delivered. And people are saying, he, he, you know, you can class him as one of the Mexican greats. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Those two Golovkin fights were epic, by the way. And I, I think they, the second one in particular really cemented him as as my favourite fighter. There, yeah, I, I, there, I said it. I think he's my favourite active fighter, Steve. You know what? And then another point from that. OK, Golovkin's ageing. We accept that. But from those two fights, who's the fighter who's still kicking on? And who's the there fighter who's possibly on the slide? I rest my case. There you go, there you go. So, um, yeah, well, let's catch up on that one next week. I'm looking forward to that fight and uh, war canelo. Well, it's that time of the week again, Steve. I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, and your fire, the fire that I'm seeing behind your eyes is raging. I've got to know. Please tell me. What are you talking about, Lewis? Talking about heavyweight matches that have been made this week. Big Joe Joyce against Alexander Rustinoff. Anthony Joshua against Big Andy Ruiz. Looking around, I don't think they've been met particularly fairly by many people. And that's annoyed me because they're okay fights. There is nothing wrong. You telling me Joe Joyce in his ninth visit professional fight fight Alexander Houstonev at 23 days notice. Come on. What do you expect him to fight? Uh, you know, how hard it is to get good heavyweights at short notice for fair money is all is, is becoming impossible in boxing at 23 days notice there is nothing wrong with Alexander Ustinev now okay he, let's be honest he wasn't great in his last fight against uh, Michael Hunter I think that was in Monte Carlo was it in November yeah yeah um, he, he didn't look good that night at all but before then, he was being spoken of as fighting, you know, of getting world title fights and getting up there again. You, it just does, it just does my head in that he's getting slammed like that, like, like he is for this fight. It's 23 days notice. It's like Andy Ruiz, you know, four or five weeks notice to fight Anthony Joshua. Who did they expect Joshua to fight? You look at the heavyweight rankings. You've got Fury, Wilder, Joshua. After that, you've got a lot of heavyweights where there's nothing between them. And Andy Ruiz is one of them. And I think he'll give he'll give a good account of himself against Joshua in the early stages of that fight. I just don't get what what are, what do people want Joe Joyce to box at three weeks' notice? What do they want Anthony Joshua to box when Jarrell Miller pulls out what well, he has to pull out because of his drug issues? And that that's what I want to know. Yeah. Well I th- I think the um I think the the issue with Ruiz has just been because of what he looks like, essentially, and that, that's why. Because he's very, he's very memeable, isn't he? You know, there's people just say he's a big fat man, and you put him up next to Anthony Joshua, and it, it doesn't make for for pleasant viewing if you're promoting yeah. that fight. But it's a hard sell. I get that, but you know, it's, when it's short notice, it, it is so hard getting people in for the right deal. It's a business, and the money's the finances have got to add up for everybody. We've got to take that into it. In, in, into account. Eddie Hearn claims, you know, he offered seven million in the end for Luis Ortiz. Now, if Luis Ortiz, seven million dollars, that is, if Luis Ortiz turn that down, then that's their problem. That's a, they got serious issues, you know. And he's got Andy Ruiz. He doesn't look the part, you know. He's hardly body beautiful, but he's got decent hands. He's not the worst in the world, and it's it's not the ideal fight. But at four or five weeks' notice, you're not going to get much better than that. And Ruiz is as good as a lot of the them the B level contenders out there. And as as I say, with Joe Joyce, he's fighting someone that has been beating semi-decent heavyweights, might have lost his last couple of fights to Manuel Char, Michael Hunter, but three weeks' notice, that's a decent test for Joe Joyce, especially because he's going to be in something big, July 13, 02 Arena in London. Yeah, and that, that is the, they are the noises that we're hearing. The thing that I'll say about Ustinov is, you know, Michael Hunter beat Ustinov and then suddenly Michael Hunter was in the Anthony Joshua sweepstakes for June the 1st. He was touted as one of the potential opponents, maybe getting down to a list of as short as three. So um, if you beat Ustinov, does that mean you're in the, in the 
the highest stakes possible you can get the biggest <laughs> fight out there I, I don't know but I don't think it's that bad an opponent I don't think it can be um, you know poo-pooed really especially yeah, at too, this late notice too, too many people ridicule in these fights there are some you know there's a fair amount of sensible people but there's a lot saying and you've got to you know, I can't emphasise enough it, it's what you can get at notice Good rant, Steve Lillis. God, you've got some heavyweight stuff on your mind this week, haven't you, Steve? Oh, I always got heavyweight stuff on my <laughs> mind. I might hope we'll have a load of heavyweights on the podcast next week. Well, heavyweights maybe next week, but this weekend, live on Box Nation, it's, of course, the big, light, heavyweight, undefeated Arta Beterbiev. What do you think? Is he is he the top dog at light heavyweight? Or is it is it Kovalev? Is it Vozdik? Oh, it's a, who, it's a real it? hard one, who isn't is it, Steve? Oh. Oh, mate, you're going to have to... You've thrown that one right at me. Oh, give it to Just, me. Who do you think? I would go right now. I will go Gavozdik. I'd go Bivol, Kovalev, Baturbiev. Now, the reason Baturbiev is fourth is purely his inactivity. That, that's why. I think, I think Gavozdik, he's the man who beat the man, which everyone seems it's to true. go down. So I think you'll go with him. You know, we couldn't really see what he'd done against Ungumbo last time. I think that was about five rounds when Ungumbo got injured. Bivol started going the, going the distance at times now, oh, hasn't yeah. he? You know, Kovalev was brilliant in his last fight against Elidia Alvarez. And let's hope he's going to fight um, Anthony Yard very soon. But Terbiev, I'll go after that purely because of his, his inactivity. Yeah, look, I was very much on the on the Bivol hype train. I thought, oh, this is it. This is the guy coming through. But then when he starts going the distance with an old John Pascal and going the distance with Joe Smith, Isaac Chilemba, well, everyone goes the distance with him. But, you know, it was it's just flatlined a little bit. Yeah. And that, that's for me. And then that, that happened around the same time Kovalev, he's supposed to be done. And suddenly he comes back and outboxes Aleda Alvarez over 12 rounds and, you know, takes his title back. So, yeah, I, I'm leaning towards Kovalev, to be honest with you. That's but. fair. You, know, you can really, you can make cases of all those four. And I'm thinking, you know, what an elite four they are, you know, or a, a star fighters, Gavozdik, Bivol, Kovalev, Baturbiev. You're reaching towards Kovalev as the best, you know, and he, as he rolled back the years against Alvarez. And you can can't argue with that. You can't, you know, if Baturbiev goes and has two, three great wins this year, could you put him number one? And the great thing for Baturbiev, if he gets busy, is unifications. He's now with top rank after sorting out these promotional issues. Top rank, uh, co-promoters of your number one, Kovalev, and of course my number one, Gavozdik, is promoted by top rank. So there's, a, there's every chance we can, we could get, we could see, you know, maybe one unification this year. I think, you know, if we're going to see one unification this year, maybe Gavozdik against Baturbiev will be the likely one. Because, of course, Kovalev has got a mandatory against Anthony Yard coming up hopefully soon. Oh, yeah. And hopefully we'll hear more about that very soon. So remember to tweet us any comments at Steve Lillis, at Sonny Dev, at The Boxing Pod and Box Nation. This Saturday night is the place to be live at 2.30 a.m. Arta Baturbiev, the beast from the east. He returns. Jerwin and Chaos defends his IBF World Super Flyweight title on that show as well. We're looking forward to it. Come along and follow us at The Boxing Pod. Steve, any closing comments? Just looking forward to seeing Baturbiev this weekend. And can he, can he become the number one light heavyweight in the world? We shall find out. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>